Good morning. Today, I'd like to talk some more about these Christoffel symbols that we had introduced previously. In particular, I want to think about the case of two-dimensional polar coordinates in a flat plane. We had figured out a wide variety of things listed here. We will make reference to these facts as we go along. Previously, we've defined a coordinate basis to be a basis that comes from coordinates. E number alpha is going to be the partial derivative of the position vector with respect to coordinate number alpha. In ordinary calculus 3, these would be the i, j, k vectors. We reasoned that the partial derivative of any one of these basis vectors with respect to one of the coordinates must be a linear combination of basis vectors at the point of interest. We called those coefficients in the linear combinations gamma, mu, alpha, beta, or other letters of indexing. These are called the Christoffel symbols. At the moment, we know very little about them. Using an exactly similar thought, I can write the partial of E beta with respect to X alpha. I get the same formula, except the roles of alpha and beta here have been interchanged from their roles here. Assuming all the functions involved are reasonably nice, continuous second partial derivatives and all, we learned in Calculus 3 that this kind of thing and that kind of thing are always equal to each other. That means that the partial derivative of E alpha with respect to X beta must equal the partial derivative of E beta with respect to X alpha. If we have a coordinate basis, a basis derived in this way, then that basis must obey these kind of equations. If I have a basis and it doesn't obey these equations, then it didn't come from a coordinate system in this manner. If we were doing calculus 3 again, none of this would matter in the least to us. If we use Cartesian coordinates or Minkowski coordinates, the partial derivatives of any of the coordinate basis vectors with respect to one of the variables is zero. That means that all of these coefficients are zero. In Cartesian or Minkowski coordinates, the Christoffel symbols are all equal to zero at every point of the space. This business about the second derivatives also has a consequence. If I write the equality that we were looking at a moment ago and rearrange it in the usual way, I find out that this quantity multiplied by basis vector number mu and then summed over mu must be the zero vector. However, the E vectors form a basis, so they're linearly independent. For this to always be true, the quantity inside the parentheses always has to be zero. That means, though, that gamma mu alpha beta must always be the same number as gamma mu beta alpha. The Christoffel symbols are symmetric in terms of the lower two indexes. This is good news. It'll greatly reduce the number of these things that we have to calculate. Speaking of which, though, we still have absolutely no clue about how we're going to calculate these things. I'm going to lean on the fact that I have Cartesian coordinates around and figure out the Christoffel symbols in polar coordinates. Here's the plan. I'm going to use these two formulas to find the partial derivatives of the polar basis vectors with respect to polar coordinates. There'll be a bit of a glitch, though, because I'm using coordinates from polar, but basis vectors from Cartesian. 
This is actually good because I know that the partial derivatives of i into j with respect to any variable is zero. At the end, though, I'll have to write everything in terms of both polar coordinates and polar basis vectors. In what follows, I'm going to feel free to use the e sub r e sub theta notation if I feel like it. Also, I'm going to abbreviate sine of theta by s and cosine of theta by c. This is just to keep the writing under control. I'm going to begin by looking at that one. Since the first basis vector of polar coordinates doesn't depend on r, the partial of e sub r with respect to r is 0, 0i zero plus 0j. Zero but if a vector is the 0 vector, its components in every coordinate system is 0, so this is the same as 0 times er plus 0 times e theta. This coefficient, 0, is gamma 1, 1, 1. This coefficient, 0, is gamma 2, 1, 1. The partial of er with respect to theta is easy enough to figure out, but as previously mentioned, we've got a problem. That's in polar, but that's in Cartesian. Same story there, but really that's no problem because I have formulas for i and j in terms of e sub r and e sub theta. So putting the expressions in, simplifying the algebra, I found out that the partial derivative of e sub r with respect to theta is 0 times e r. This coefficient 0 is gamma 1, 1, 2 plus 1 over r e sub theta, that would be gamma 2, 1, 2. The preceding facts were figured out by taking derivatives of e sub r, first with respect to r, then later repeating the calculation with respect to theta. We'll get additional facts by doing the same thing to e sub theta. Therefore, we find out that gamma 1, 2, 1 is 0, and gamma 2, 2, 1 is 1 divided by the r coordinate. We'll get our last Christoffel symbols by taking this expression and finding its partial derivative with respect to theta instead of r. This time, it turns out that the partial derivative is a multiple of basis vector number e sub r, so the Christoffel symbol 1, 2, 2 is negative r, and Christoffel symbol 2, 2, 2 is 0. We have now calculated all of the Christoffel symbols. So this summarizes everything we've figured out. Notice that gamma 1, 1, 2 and gamma 1, 2, 1 are both equal to 0, as they should be. Also, gamma 2, 2, 1 and gamma 2, 1, 2 are both equal to 1 over r, as they should be, because we're working in a coordinate basis, which guarantees that the Christoffel symbols are symmetric in the lower two indexes. Now, a reasonable person is wondering what this has to do with anything. I want to think about a vector v. It may be a vector that depends on position, or maybe it's a constant vector. I'm not worried about that right now. I am going to take into account the possibility that my coordinates are not flat coordinates. So when I say that I want to do the partial derivative with respect to x beta of v, I'm talking about the arrow v. I have to tell you not only the components, but I have to tell you the basis vectors too. Doing the ordinary product rule for partial derivatives, I'm going to look at the components individually 
and to differentiate them with respect to x beta. Once I have that, I'll add a factor of e alpha. If the basis vectors were constants, like they are in Cartesian or Minkowski, that would be the end of the story. However, writing the product rule down, if the e vectors are not constants, then this term will typically not be zero, and we have to deal with it. We've decided to write the partial derivatives of basis vectors with respect to coordinates as linear combinations of the basis vectors at the appropriate spot. I need to relabel something here. In this first term, alpha is an index of summation. In this first term only, I can replace alpha with any other letter that I feel like. Well, except beta, and x, and v, and e. Other than that, though, I'm free to change the name of index alpha to, say, mu. With that indexing, I'm able to bring this e sub mu out from the two sums. The quantity inside the brackets represents the actual rate of change of the vector in terms of the basis vectors that you're talking about. A very common abbreviation is to write comma beta to represent taking the partial derivative with respect to x number beta. If you use that notation, our result becomes this. These are Quantities that depend on location, the components of v at the various locations, and the rates of change of the components only of v at various locations. This is the partial derivative with respect to x number beta of the arrow v. We're going to introduce a new notation. We're going to call v mu semicolon beta, the quantity inside the brackets. This is called the components of the covariant derivative of v, and it's the thing that takes rate of changes into account, allowing for both the components and the basis vectors to change. People use a wide variety of symbolisms for this, I'm just going to keep it simple for now. The partial derivative with respect to x number beta of vector v is the contraction of the components of the covariant derivative with respect to the basis vectors. I want to think about the straightest possible path through either a two or three dimensional Euclidean space or Minkowski space. I'm thinking particularly of the relativity situation. So I'm going to think of a material object moving with coordinates given by x0, x1, x2, and x3. The four velocity is the derivative of position with respect to proper time. And if I'm moving in a straight line, or straightest line, as we'll say later, the derivative of u should be zero. I can do the product rule and write this equation out. The derivative of a vector with respect to a scalar is partial derivative of that vector with respect to x number beta multiplied by the derivative of x number beta with respect to the scalar in question, which here is tau. This is very similar to something that we've seen before. I'm going to re-index this so that the alpha becomes mu, and I'm going to look at that and remember that I know what the partial of E alpha with respect to X beta is. And it goes without saying that all of these quantities are evaluated at whatever point we're interested in at the moment. Doing the usual splitting up, 
is saying the usual words about the E vectors forming a basis and therefore being linearly independent, the quantity inside the bracket has to be zero at every point of interest. What we get is a collection of differential equations which describe the straightest possible paths. These paths we'll call geodesics. You might be wondering why we don't just call them straight lines. We'll talk about that later. If I write in the Christoffel symbols as we've figured them out, the differential equations that a straightest path has to obey are these two equations. At first glance, it doesn't look very promising, but that second equation has a very interesting property to it. That second equation is very interesting. If you multiply it by r squared, it turns out that you can simplify the situation quite a bit. This equation is the same as derivative with respect to tau of r squared d theta d tau equal to zero. That means r squared d theta d tau must be a constant. I'm calling it h. It's very important to understand something here. We're not doing any physics to speak of, and yet this looks like the angular momentum per unit mass. We'll come back to that later. To keep this from being longer than it needs to be, I'm going to stop here for today. Next, I want to solve these differential equations. We already know what the answer has got to be, so this will be reassuring to us that all of our crazy ideas are working as they should be. Until then, I hope everybody has a good day, and I'll talk to you again soon.